in Cheshire. We're joined by Rebecca Ruth Gould, who is Distinguished Professor of Comparative Poetics and Global Politics at the School of Oriental and African Studies in London. Uh, and what else could we be discussing but the dreadful events in Gaza? Rebecca, thanks very much for joining us on The Popular Show. Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, Rebecca is the author of a new book, uh, which is called Erasing Palestine, uh, a title which is um, maybe yet more fitting um, than, than it was when, um, when you su submitted it to the publisher, as we're currently witnessing the destruction of all of the key infrastructure in Gaza, as well as um, demands that Gazans leave their homes, apparently uh, um, being displaced into Egypt or, or God knows where. Um, it's a book uh, that describes your own time, brief time working in Israel whilst living on the other side of, of the country in, in, in Palestine in the West Bank. Um, it then describes your experience in UK academia um, and your run-in with the anti-anti-Semitism uh, lobby that we've covered a fair bit on the show and had uh, the odd brush with ourselves. Um, and it also presents a, um, a theory or an argument for improving our language on how we talk about questions of anti-Semitism and how we talk about Israel and Palestine. Uh, it, it's very difficult to disentangle those two things, uh, as many of our comrades and interlocutors have been finding over the past week. Um, so uh, have I sort of described the book <laughs> fairly, Rebecca? Yep. Anything you want to add to that? Uh, uh, I think that sounds about right. I mean, I, I think, I guess I also try to think about how free speech can be helpful um, in the struggle, um, because it's, 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 uh, yeah, that it's, it's all, I think there's potential there in terms of carrying forward the struggle for for Palestinian liberation, uh, in, especially outside the uh, outside Palestine, it has to take place in the domain of free speech. So I also dwell on that, try to claim it back from its sort of right wing appropriation. Well, I think that's extremely important as well. And and uh, I think David and I are both can have things to say about that over the, over the course of the episode. Um, well, uh, look, as we go along, we will we'll, we'll be sort of applying uh, insights from your book and also applying the instructive things about your own experience with various institutions um, uh, over the last um, decade or so. But maybe we could start with your own time spent, as I say, living in Palestine and working in Israel. Um, maybe you could sort of tell us this story. But what, what I think a lot of listeners will be interested in is, I mean, we're, we're going back um, a decade or more here. But um, the, the, the term that the UN uses about Israel is apartheid. Uh, and that is also a term that, especially in, in British universities at the moment, there's a lot of pressure to stop us using that term to describe Israel. You, you of course, were there. And um, I mean, quite apart from the, 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 the violence that we're seeing right now, you also describe in the book what might be thought of as the sort of the, the humdrum and boring and annoying side of living under um, a, a system that affords different civil rights to different groups. Yes, uh, that that's definitely a very important experience. I mean, certainly, you know, in the context of uh, Palestinians living in the West Bank, working in Jerusalem, which is really, or working elsewhere in in Israel, which is uh, where the really the only really um, well paying jobs are. Um, that's that's everyday experience uh, is characterized by an apartheid system, and it, it's not it doesn't take on these kind of dramatic. Um, genocidal dimensions that are happening right now in Gaza, but it's it's a context for understanding this this conflict over the course of many decades. And I, I think it um, it has. So I was there in um, 2011, from 2011 to 2012, and I commuted uh, through checkpoint uh, 300, uh, which is right at the border of uh, uh, Bethlehem and, and Jerusalem. And these are very places that are just like next door neighbors to each other. Um, but but getting from one side to the other takes several hours. And it, it it's obviously gotten much even worse since since I've left, but it was it, it's an arduous journey. In some cases, a dangerous journey because the soldiers who are manning the checkpoints are um, very well armed. And, the, and yeah, it's also a journey where you 
witness face to face this kind of uh, apartheid system. There are separate lines. Of course, I was as a you know white American. Um, I had a certain level of protection um, that Palestinians didn't. But we were next to you know there are separate lines for foreigners and Palestinians. Uh, the bus system is another very interesting instance of how apartheid works. Um, it, th- it's not it's not the case. There aren't like official laws saying that Palestinians can't travel on the Israeli buses, or, but but they don't dare because it's dangerous. It's very you know. Mm. Um, it's not safe. And and that's, again, it's increasingly so, and probably in the upcoming, uh, certainly right now at this moment, it, it definitely isn't safe, right? For, um, and uh, yeah, so it's a completely separate system, just getting from, uh, even going through Jerusalem, uh, separate bus systems, much that the quality of the upkeep of the Israeli system is is strikingly different right the infrastructure the support that's given by by the uh, israeli state or the jerusalem um city for for the upkeep of the services uh is very very dramatically different things like libraries uh schools are also very very dramatically different i just if you cross the border from west jerusalem to east jerusalem it's just it's like completely separate worlds in that sense so yeah that's 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 the context i mean that's that's the better that's that's you know those who are privileged enough to not live in gaza to have some mild freedom of movement they can see this kind of drastic inequality um and the way roads are built you know from from um uh israel uh jerusalem tel aviv to the settlements that that are not not open to palestinians and you know of course the laws don't say well palestinians can't enter but you have to have a certain kind of id you have to have and so that's how the apartheid system works like through through ids uh verifications checkpoints um it 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 doesn't you know in a sense i think it's been possible to kind of deny for for a while you know it was possible to say it wasn't quite the same as apartheid because it wasn't so explicitly racialized but now i think we're at a moment where human rights watch amnesty international you know have fully acknowledged it's it's a consensus in the human rights community that this is an apartheid system yeah and you you went to israel i mean you you didn't go as a as a sort of paid up pro-Palestinian activists, the fact that you were there at all in defiance of the academic boycott on, on, on taking up academic positions in Israeli universities uh, attest to that. But, but you didn't end up finishing the, um, the, the, the appointment mm-hmm. that you were there for because, as I understand it, you, you just found it un- unbearable what you, were, what you were seeing. And that prompted you to write this article, which sometime later would have professional consequences for you beyond anti-Semitism. Could you describe that uh, to the listeners, please? Sure. Um, so I should say I was I had a fellowship uh, with the Vanley Institute, which I mean, as I think it, it is one of the only um, uh, scholarly organizations in, in Israel that that does seek to uh, support in, in whatever way they can Palestinian rights. It's very much in the left, um, you know, in, in this in the scheme of things. Um, and I, I, I even at that time, you know, I was respectful of the boycott. I support it. But, but at the same time, I felt like if I really want to. I don't want to just take other word, other, other other people's words for what's going on. I do want to see it myself, and that was a way to do it. And my, my condition, you know, for accepting that fellowship for myself was that I would be living in uh, Bethlehem, which I, I think did impose. Uh, yeah, it wasn't necessarily what what they liked at the institute. It did impose, a, you know, a, com- a completely different kind of life experience. Um, than mm-hmm. they intended for for the uh, postdoctoral fellows, um, but yes, even even then. So I, you know, I'm kind of glad I saw what I saw because I I am the kind of person where I do want to see with my own eyes what's going on before I start making claims about it. And I was very struck by the kind of bubble that uh, Israelis live in. You know, met, I mean, many of them are obviously very unhappy with their government and and to some extent aware of what's going on. But the fact that you know they can't go uh, and and many of them don't want to go, but they also can't according to their they're not legally allowed to enter into the Palestinian territories um, really creates this, I mean, it's it's kind of a, a technologically refined form of apartheid where you don't even just, you know, thanks to modern technology, you really don't kind of need to know what the other side is doing. And yeah, and so that that was a very surreal thing. Like I, I'd, I'd live in one world in Bethlehem and then go to Jerusalem and 
no, you know, they just didn't have a clue a, a kind of, or even acknowledged in a very passive way what was taking place. And I, I think, yeah, one of the kind of turning points was um, going on a, a, to Hebron and seeing the, the uh, which is a very famous, very well known for the settler movement. It's part of the West Bank, but it's, it's just a very endangered um, city uh, where the settlers are particularly violent there. And a major, a big massacre, in fact, occurred there about uh, two decades ago uh, by a, a man named Bo Gold Goldstein uh, just massacred 20 or 30 uh, Palestinians at prayer. And there is a, um, a monument to him uh, there right now um, in, in the settlement in Hebron. And so, yeah, you got the sense of um, it being just like I didn't. Yeah, I did, I, at a certain point, I felt like I can't, you know, I've, I've educated myself and I just need to, to step away and and not continue in that apartheid system in whatever in any way. And and so I, I wrote about right around the time when I was um about to leave, I, I uh, left the position. Um, I, I wrote a sort of quick article, um, actually using the the ideas of, of a, um, a former member of the Knesset uh, named Avram Borg, an Israeli uh, who's very critical of, of the Israeli state. Uh, he was talking about kind of the instrumentalization of the Holocaust and how, how uh, the Israeli government uses that traumatic history to justify its its apartheid practices in the West Bank. And uh, I, I cited it. I, I, you know, it was it was definitely something that was written with anger. Um, but but it was it was, you know, I think it said what it needed to be said at the time. It, and it was called Beyond Anti-Semitism. And it was published in the journal Counterpunch. And then, you know, I, I do, I work on many different things. I just kind of went on. So that was 2012. I left my position um, in, in um, Jerusalem and I moved to the UK and sort of went on with my life writing about other stuff. I work generally in the Middle East. I also work in Iran. So I was just totally kind of, that was a chapter in my life that I didn't necessarily expect I would be returning to. Um, but then I was kind of compelled to return to it um, in 2017. And I think the the reasons that brought me to that um, are very significant, you know, for everyone in the UK and particularly for academics, uh, because the the uh, UK government under Theresa May in 2016, December 2016, was the first government in the world to adopt what is called the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, also called the IRA definition. And this is a definition that, unlike other approaches to understanding anti-Semitism, really focuses and conflates the criticism of Israel with anti-Semitism. And it's it's been around for a while, actually, it's been around for about two decades, but it's kind of adoption by the UK and now by many, many countries, maybe around 100 countries in the world, um, has brought about a kind of sea change, sea change in how anti-Semitism is understood, particularly at the bureaucratic level, so by universities, by public bodies, by when in the context of say you know racial anti discrimination uh, bureaucratic context, uh, it, it provides a kind of leverage uh, for people who are trying to advance a certain or trying to silence criticism of Israel. Um, yeah, so it has eleven examples um, of what anti semitism is, and seven of those are about Israel. Uh, and there's a lot. Yeah, obviously that, that that's a big part of my book is talking about the history of that definition, other ways of understanding anti semitism, and what's wrong with this definition. It's a very. Oh, I didn't mean to the, the question that you asked though. Should I continue that story? Uh, break, break no, but um, well, let me just jump in on, on the IHRA. Just, just uh, I mean, li listeners have heard um, Anthony Lerman on, on this mm -hmm. show give his um, his sort of inside account of how um, Jewish community organisations were, were were sort of pressed into supporting this, and how instrumental Israel itself was in promoting this idea that the most important kind of anti-Semitism to to look out for and be worried about, and for states to be policing, is not people personally disliking Jews or, or trying to do things to Jews, but people uh, criticizing Israel. And uh, you, you, you present a, a very valuable um, critique of your own of, of that definition um, in, the, in the text. Um, uh, yeah, sorry, I'm itching to get ahead of the story because it's very interesting what happens next, but please, please continue. Okay, so uh, continue, continuing the story, yeah, that's, yeah, the, yeah. that's the kind of political yeah. and intellectual context yeah. for the story, um, which is that, yes, in February of 2017, 
Uh, I was accused of anti-Semitism. Actually, I was first accused by a student who uh, was in, I never actually met the student, uh, but he was in one of my classes, apparently like a large lecture class. I never spoke to him. And he came across this article that I'd referenced from, that I'd written from 2012. Uh, and uh, it's in what seems a kind of um, strategy for kind of um, uh, advancing a cause, uh, he he decided he was going to publish an op-ed about that art that article of mine called "Beyond Anti-Semitism" in the student newspaper uh, to coincide with Holocaust Memorial Day and to basically call out uh, me um, as someone who you know was anti-Semitic was uh, uh, really uh, yeah. Th th although the article, everyone is welcome to read it. By the way, it's on my my ResearchGate profile. Um, but you know he saw it as, as anti uh, anti-Semitic um, and. And the that so there was an op-ed published, but the student ultimately, as far as I understand, and of course I wasn't fully a part of all the backdoor negotiations at my university. I believe that the student didn't like advance a formal complaint against me. Mm. Uh, what happened? So he just publishes op-ed. There's a little bit of controversy. The Telegraph uh, ran a Daily Telegraph ran a, a, a story about you know this anti-Semitic anti lecture. Eric Pickles weighed in, uh, saying that it was one of the worst cases of uh, Holocaust denial he had seen, and and the author me should uh, consider her position. But at that point, it was just like a little bit of outrage on the right wing, basically. But then the, the the moment when it kind of became something that I had to get a lawyer for was when um, the uh, organization called the Campaign Against, Against Anti-Semitism uh, did make a formal complaint to the university. And uh, that the university then, you know, according to the laws of of this country did have to, to um, act in some way. And so they uh, convened a panel, um, uh, the identity of which was never made known to me to kind of um, assess whether the article was anti-Semitic or not. That went on for, and, and this is just worth mentioning that in this context, that it's not, it's not just a personal story. I think the reason why is that it is significant, you know, for everyone in the UK is that that had never happened in the UK, that, that someone's that writing about Israel and Palestine uh, had, it, within a UK academic context had become um, the subject of complaint investigation. Uh, I'm an American, you know, so I, and I went to, I got my PhD from Columbia. So I'm very used to that kind of politicization of the discourse around Palestine. But my understanding is that in the, in the UK before uh, 2016, 2017, it wasn't like that. You know, there, there was a lot, there was a lot more freedom for um, Israel critical scholarship and writing. So I have, and I happen to be that kind of, um, guinea pig uh, test case uh, where, you know, after the IHRA definition that this was continuing, which meant that all the complaints against my article by, by the student, by this organization, they all tied their claims about its anti-Semitism to the IHRA definition, which um, criminal or this defines a, a criticism of, of Israel as potentially anti-Semitic. So, in a sense, that adoption of the uh, by the UK government of the IRA definition was what enabled this um, this accusation, the series of accusations against me, which made it you know much more serious and consequential than it otherwise would have been. So ultimately, um, I was uh, that went on for six months. And I, I must say, I learned a lot. Uh, I think a lot of people, you know, about law, about free speech, about anti-Semitism, um, a lot of the people I was speaking to. So this is sort of early days, as I, I think it's really just really important to emphasize this. You know, we've, I think, seen a sea change in terms of what can be said about Israel and Palestine. But at the point when this was happening in 2017, uh, it, yeah, I think a lot of people kind of didn't expect the complaint to go anywhere. And ultimately, you know, I was vindicated, if that's the right word, but it was just a very arduous legal process. Um, and I wasn't the only person at the time. It's important to mention I have a Palestinian colleague, uh, uh, Malika Schweik, uh, who's actually from Gaza. She's now in the UK. Uh, she also at University of Exeter, she came under attack uh, within this uh, a week by the same organization. Some of her tweets were criticized. Uh, uh, and uh, in fact, there was a, a video uh, was produced of by this organization that had complained about me. It was produced on YouTube, uh, pasting a swastika on her face. Um, and it was really scary stuff. Um, anyway, so, so yeah, this is this is kind of the beginnings. Um, yeah. yeah, so I learned a lot about that. <laughs> about everything. Yeah, and, uh, and the same campaign has actually taken some academic scalps. So they didn't. They didn't manage to get you fired, but they've got other people fired since. Um, I, I mean, I think this is all like really crucial context for understanding the the situation in which we're 
entering now in trying to talk about and trying to protest and trying to intervene in um, the the current Gaza war. Um, but j just to get a, a little bit more detail on on um, your situation, I find it very striking that um, really illustrates how quickly things have changed and how quickly freedom of speech has been clamped down on on this issue. So so the the um, the fashion of academics in the UK being complained about and eventually now fired um, uh, uh, over this issue has, has, as you describe, escalated very quickly. But if, if we think about it, so in 2012, you, you published that counterpunch piece and it passes really without comment. I mean, you, you, you conclude yeah. the piece by by saying, well, I mean, but this is a, this is a thread of the arguments that uh, the Holocaust is sort of held over Jews heads as this as this threat it could happen again and this is why you have to defend israel uh when as you conclude the piece in fact uh there the, there are comparisons to be made between what went on in the holocaust and what goes on with the palestinians that's of course is one of the things that you're technically not allowed to say according to the rhra definition of anti-semitism now uh, i mean i know you say in the book that you wouldn't put it that way um, today, but the important thing is, in 2012, no one really batted an eyelid. Some people didn't like uh, such comparisons; other people didn't mind them. But the point is, no one thought that this was a fireable offence, or, as Eric Pickles put it, an act of Holocaust denial. Indeed, the worst act of Holocaust right. denial <laughs> he'd ever seen. We flash forward to 2017, and a, a student digs it out, and uh, all um, hell breaks loose. Um, I, Actually, it's really fascinating to me that the dates here line up with one of the most publicized incidents in the uh, Labour Party anti-Semitism affair, which wow. was um, Jeremy Corbyn's reply on Facebook to a, a post about um, a mural by uh, an artist called Mir One, um, the, the, uh, the famous mural of the bankers uh kind of you know playing monopoly or whatever on, on the backs of um what looked like black people um this this mural which whatever common opinion by now regards as anti-semitic in 2012 corbyn among other people kind of in passing on facebook said ah oh, this is you know this should be this shouldn't be happening because of freedom of expression and so on um actually the jewish chronicle um, at the time, and even Harry's Place, a, an extremely um, pro-Zionist uh, and anti-anti-war uh, <laughs> uh, blog, they all said, you know, maybe it's anti-Semitic, maybe it isn't. Harry's Place said it shouldn't be taken down. Jewish Chronicle said it's got anti-Semitic overtones. We flash forward to 2018, Corbyn's replies dug up, kind of similarly to your article being dug up and suddenly everyone is saying this is unambiguous that this is anti-semitic you know I, I, i'm not really interested in litigating whether either thing is or isn't anti-semitic the point is in 2012 no one thought it was or, or no one thought it was cut and dried in either case no one had a, no one really was bothered you flash forward to 2017 2018 and there is this huge amount of um attention on it, what do you think had changed in the interim? Uh, you you uh, don't say too much about uh, uh, Corbyn or, or any of that in, in in the book, but do you think there's a, a connection there? Do you think that you were targeted because of this increase in interest in anti-Semitism, because the left and a pro-Palestinian uh, figure were, were suddenly becoming politically important in Britain? Yes. And just before I answer your question, I'm afraid I let me let me flag something I want to discuss after so I don't forget. Yeah. I do want to talk a little bit about that point about what I would have written differently, because I think it does apply to the contemporary context. Let me just flag that um, no, to yeah. answer the question, what changed and what what made it so powerful? So the, the sort of genius of this definition and, you know, we had, I think as political strategists, people interested in politics, we just have to kind of not admire, but remark on how effective it's been in silencing, you know, the other side, our side. Um, yeah. It's it's this, it's actually not just about the content, it's about what I would call the form. Um, and that's why I published an article called Legal Form uh, to describe this. It's about this word adoption. I think that's something we shouldn't lose sight of. So this is relatively new in terms of like thinking about how we deal with racism, the verb that's used there. So, you know, there are, throughout history obviously people have had lots of ideas about what's racist what is and it's always been a subject of robust debate and in, in a good sense right but what what was really 
I think effective about the strategist who formulated the IRA definition is that this idea that, you know, a government's, it was originally governments and then it became universities and public bodies need to quote unquote adopt a definition. Now, they present it, the, the the form that takes, you know, normally when a government like makes a big statement, it, um, you would, it's, there's something kind of a legal aspect to it, right? Even if it doesn't go through parliament, which obviously this is not, um, th it has a kind of legal force. Like Theresa May, you know, the, the government issued a statement about this adoption of the definition, but, but that's, that's, it was a, just a policy statement, basically a press release. But because there's no kind of context for understanding what it means for a government to adopt a definition, you know, mm -hmm. outside of a, a legal transformation that would be a bill going through parliament, it kind of has this halo of legal force. In other words, it gets this leverage from this word adopt, like, you know, that th there's some kind of legal consequence, you know, that that's what is implied in that. This, this idea, this request that that was that was uh, pressed, you know, governments were asked to adopt something. It means that if they, you know, at some point um, don't adopt it or don't apply it, they're somehow legally in breach, you know, of something could be accused of racism. I think that's that was the the genius move. Right. So it wasn't just about what it, it the putting it in a form that even though it isn't actually like a law, it doesn't have any kind of, dem, you know, no democratic form through which it's been accepted or debated. It still has legal force just because yeah. people attribute this force to it. Um, yeah, this, this is what our, our friend uh, Teresa Caldova calls mm -hmm. compliance thinking where yes. you, mm -hmm. it's almost because you're not legally obligated to do it that as an institution you do it even more fervently because right. there aren't strict uh, lines and divides of responsibility yes. so everyone's in a competition to show how compliant they are as exactly. opposed to merely just follow the it's rules. About a performance it makes it the, the whole the whole exercise and kind of dealing with racism it becomes like a box ticking exercise it becomes very performative and i not only does it silence palestinian speech it also doesn't help with dealing with anti-semitism it's because it's all about show and performance um and and the death you know anyone who reads this document i mean just you know, purely from a kind of objective academic perspective of wanting to know what it's actually saying, we find that it's just incredibly vague. And that too is by mm. design, you know, that the vaguer, the more effective because people, <laughs> they don't know what the limits are. So I, I think that's, that's what kind of makes it, that's kind of what explains its, its effectiveness in, in, in um, silencing speech that, and, and the government, so the government, you know, in other words, Theresa May's government, the conservative government, and unfortunately now, you know, the Labour Party as well was able to kind of act as if it was the sacred, sacrosanct text that everyone has to abide by, when actually there was no democratic process through which it passed any of the standard, you know, vetting stages that are, that, that these kinds of, you know, truly sacrosanct things like a constitution, you know, go through. So, yeah, I think that's, that kind of explains the effectiveness. So you were um, in a uh, university of Bristol, 2017, the student mm -hmm. complains about the, this, um, this article uh, that you'd written. It, uh, I mean, it, it wasn't even up on the counter punch website at this point. So right. That's correct. Yeah, no, in fact, it was, I think it was always, what happened was it was a, uh, it was just in their print version. Oh but yeah. I, I myself mm -hmm. had uploaded it to the repository. Oh, and in fact, I, I should also mention that I was um, kind of pressured, especially by the telegraph and, maybe indirectly by my colleagues to renounce, you know, what I'd said mm -hmm. there. Um, and while I did say in my book, and I'll get into this, you know, there's certain things I would have written differently. I was never, ever going to renounce it. I, I mean, there was just nothing. I was writing what I saw with my own eyes, you know, on a documentary basis. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I myself, I've never been kind of ashamed of it. I put it on on, on a repository. And, and then, but, you know, I, at the same time, I wouldn't say it's like the most thoughtful thing I've ever written. It was just something that I, you know, a, a, an act of witness yeah. bearing. Yeah, and it and it didn't warrant the uh, right. the shitstorm that uh, right. it it created. So student complains, and then the case is picked up by the campaign against anti-Semitism, which is a charity um, here in the UK. And our listeners um, would have encountered them before. They were one of the um, the groups that contributed to the submission to the Equality and Human Rights Commission's investigation into the Labour Party um, in an episode from about a year ago, uh, which people can scroll back to. We called it The Real Racists. Um, one of the top guys in, in the campaign against anti-Semitism, we showed the video that he released uh, in December after the 2019 
election um, gloating about how they had done this organized campaign of, of searching through everyone's tweets and doing all these kind of keyword searches on social media in order to represent Corbyn supporters as anti-Semitic. So they were a very organized operation when it came to discrediting the Labour Party. They are also the group who produced the um, recent documentary about Roger Waters, which takes two people that he's worked with over the course of his long career and uh, sits them down and gets them to say about talk about how anti-Semitic Roger Waters uh, is. Uh, and now we encounter them again as the, the main group who were looking for you to lose your job. Well, I mean, they represent themselves as just a, a charity, a group of good-hearted anti-racist volunteers. Um, even some people on the right of the Labour Party have become sick of them. Uh, Margaret Hodge, of all people, mm. uh, the person who called uh, Jeremy Corbyn uh, uh, an effing anti-Semite in Parliament, she um, has has complained about them and said that actually that these these uh, these guys. Uh, are right wingers and, and are against the Labour Party as such. I, she's saying, I, I thought they were only against my enemies in the Labour Party, but it turns out they're against me as well. Um, what was your sense of who you were dealing with here? Um, if well, you even I, I, want to talk about that. Yeah, yeah, interesting <laughs> question. I mean, obviously, I, yeah, I don't want to create more problems in my answer, but um, I will say, so let me just focus. I agree with everything you said, but I'm also just going to say that they are a very effective group and uh, it's trying to achieve the opposite of what I would like to achieve. But I think it's just worth, you know, maybe there are certain things that can be learned as well. Um, yeah. So I, I, they did. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're, you're right. We should be realists in, in right. this, uh, in this they, matter. So yeah, sure, they, they yeah. struck me as completely committed to everything I opposed. Yes. And yes, but yes, also very effective. And um uh, yeah, I, I, I was, I'm interested in learning of how they achieve that. I mean, I think they have uh, good ties with the conservative government. They, they in fact, writ have written about, you know, their various meetings with, uh, well, with Theresa May herself, in fact, unfortunately. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, I mean, I think there's enough bad things. They, I, they, the, the badness of what they represent kind of speaks for itself. So let's that, let's leave it. I mean, I, th for me, like the worst thing that that I've witnessed is this. Uh, video on YouTube, uh, really Islamophobic video, I would say inciting violence against my Palestinian colleague. But but yeah, they are a very effective group. They have they have a like a whisper network. I don't know if this is the right term, but kind of network of students. Uh, they who are invited to submit complaints about various instructors. Um, I mean, there are a lot of parallels. To, I, in fact, I, I would say if if we look to the U.S., we can see that can't groups like Campus Watch and so forth. Right? It's yeah. kind of. I would hope that they haven't quite reached that stage, but they may eventually. But on the other hand, I, I mean, you know, maybe, I, but I would distinguish actually at this point. I mean, if, you know, if they're listening, they may well be. I, I think that they, they have, um, it, it, they work with, you know, so, established, an established legal um, community, which take that for what it, what it's worth. I mean, so they have an effectiveness. Let me just put it that way. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think that's useful. Um, I, I mean, we'll, we'll get onto this, but the, the renewed attention on campuses and on universities mm -hmm. and on protests right now, I think, suggests that they, you know, having defeated the, the pro-Palestinian movement in Parliament, um, it, it would not surprise me at all if the next frontier and, and the next um, r real big push during this. Gaza and war, um, you know, was uh, was universities. Um, I, th I think we're already kind of seeing that. Um, okay, well, let, let's get into. I, I, yeah, please. I flagged, I flagged that I said I wanted to kind of um, talk about. Well, anyway, yeah, the the, the, the difference you, or kind of what I've. It's it's not so much that yeah. I, again, I stand by what I wrote in that article, but but I just want to mm. add a little a little bit of. Uh, just a different, yeah, a little bit perspective that it's not exactly different, but it's it's kind of going a bit deeper. Um, so I think one thing, you know, at the time when when I came under this these attacks, um, I was shocked, you know, just to be accused of anti-Semitism because I'm anti-racist, I'm against anti-Semitism. I mean, I, I you know care a lot about the, his, the history of racism, and so I talked, just talked to a lot of people. I just tried to listen, you know, how would any? It, it didn't occur to me that anyone would see anti-Semitism, you know, and I was curious, like, how, where do you draw this conclusion? And I had an interesting conversation with a scholar of anti-Semitism who did support me. I mean, um, you know, but 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 I wanted to have like a frank conversation of 
if, if there was anything in my what I wrote that made him uncomfortable. And he did say something interesting to me, um, which I think is very, very relevant to this to today, right now, what's happening in Gaza. We should not forget it. So he said that with things like the Holocaust, there are no silver linings. And sometimes, you know, there is a tendency, I think, in this kind of Nazi Israel comparison, which does have, you know, I think any sensible person would see some similarities. But but I think the conclusion to draw from those similarities is to bear in mind that there is no silver lining. Right. So it's if there are aspects of the Israeli right that that are echoing, you know, the rhetoric of the Nazis. Rather than saying that that's ironic or it's surprising, actually, it's exactly how genocide works. It's exactly how trauma works. So I think it, you know what I mean? And I, I think yeah. I think we shouldn't, and, and I shouldn't, I mean, I don't think I consciously did, but maybe some people interpreted me as kind of like holding Jews to a higher standard. And sure. now, yeah, I, 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 when I see what's happening in Gaza, same thing, right? The consequences of what is happening right now are not going to make the Gazans more noble, more generous, more kind, more pure, just as it didn't happen, you know, with the Holocaust. We should never expect the victims of genocide to be better than than history has allowed them to be. And I think that goes, you know, so it applies across. Yeah, the I mean, so so that that's the that's what the silver lining remark means. Yes, like the exactly. silver lining would be, it's oh, yeah. on the on the downside, six million Jews were murdered. On the upside. You guys learned about how to treat people. That would be the cruise yeah, kind of version. Yeah, I think, I think but, there is a tendency to kind of expect, you know, Jews to, yeah. Jews to be better because of that. But why should we? It doesn't I happen. Mean, on, except, yeah. At the same time, I, I mean, the, the t there is a taboo on on making comparisons between Israel and the Nazis. I mean, interpersonally, and if you're having a political conversation or a debate, it's almost entirely useless because um it is going it, it's going to upset people in the in the discussion and and the com the substantive discussion is going to be derailed i mean that's my main objection to it right. um however the fact that it has been quasi legally codified as something mm -hmm. that you're not allowed to say is 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 completely illegitimate as far as i'm concerned yeah. and and i would i would just throw in here jacqueline rose's um mm -hmm. discussion in her book the question of zion which, which which responds to this idea? Oh, how 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 could you? This is so obscene to to um, compare uh, uh, what what, um, what what is happening in Israel to to this great uh, crime against the the Jewish people. But I mean, on slightly similar similar grounds to, to what you just said, Rose says that this is completely psychologically um, to be expected and, and mm -hmm. plausible. Of course, people. Um, even on an individual basis, emulate the the, right. the behavior and psychology of their tormentors and, and their oppressors. Um, I mean, j just historically, of course, the existence of Israel is bound up with the Holocaust. It, it would not have had the amount of consent it had in other more powerful countries if it hadn't been for the Holocaust. The Jew, the Jewish people wouldn't have been there as refugees in order to provide a population for Israel in 1948 if it hadn't been for the Holocaust. Um, and I mean, there's a whole like culture in Israel. There's a whole subculture of Israeli jokes and, and, and humor and popular culture uh, and self-representation and, and, and sexual politics about the fact that in Israel, they're the, the tough ones who it wouldn't happen to again in the diaspora Jews are all like Woody Allen and Larry David, cringing and weak and embarrassed all the time, whereas Israel's the strong place where they couldn't do it to us again. Everything about Israel is 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 wrapped up in this this contest and this claiming and this reaction to the Holocaust from from right. from the, the deepest psychological things to open kind of jokes and 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 um, and self representation. So the idea right. that suddenly it becomes unacceptable when it, it comes to talking about the treatment of um, a, a dispossessed population is completely absurd as as far as I'm concerned. As I say, I mean, you expect you were trying to be provocative when you when you made the comparison. You, you were being rhetorical. You expected it to piss people off to some extent. The idea that it would constitute illegal speech, the idea that it would constitute Holocaust denial, um, 
I mean, you know, people who say, people who say crudely Israelis should have learned from the Holocaust. The one thing they're not doing is denying the Holocaust. <laughs> you know, um, is uh, is just a kind of to me such a clear cut example of the way in which we've allowed a blurring between being rude and impolite and unkind and being you know doing something illegal. This is this is a dreadful slippage an absolutely dreadful one and a completely anti-intellectual one as well and yeah and i'll just add that i just based on kind of my empirical experience of talking to the university lawyers talking to the administrators i don't believe that anyone at any point ever actually thought there was anti-semitism you know so it was about i so yeah i think again it was about this idea of adoption the government had adopted this definition therefore regardless of whether what they see before their eyes you know they couldn't trust that gut instinct that we rely on to, to kind of figure out whether something's racist or not they had to go through this this procedure and uh joe, joe this was also about around the time that joe johnson was writing to universities telling them they, that they should they should adopt the definition so the university knew extremely well that you know the proceedings of of their um inquiry into my article was going to potentially be subject to government scrutiny right they could get into big trouble if they didn't check all their boxes uh create an, a chilling environment and so forth so it wasn't you know i'm not even sure that kind of our everyday sense of what anti-semitism is is just like has has shifted nearly as much as the kind of bureaucratic apparatus into which we are subjected for 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 kind of addressing these accusations let's just give, give a brief survey of um where we are now with censorship that that was the, that was your situation in in 2017 we flash forward to 2023 um, a, 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 an absolutely horrifying um, incursion by Hamas into um, this Israeli music festival uh, at the start of, of last week. Um, kill, indiscriminate killing of, of civilians, um, murder in uh, nearby settlements and kibbutzes, followed by um, a retaliation by Israel that we are, are currently observing, a, a, a situation that uh, warrants the highest level of political debate, the highest level of democratic right. scrutiny, and the highest level of freedom of speech. We're, we're watching absolutely unprecedented um, uh, um, acts. I'll, I'll, I'll put, it at that, uh, put it that way. The reaction, however, is an equally unprecedented clamping down on our ability to talk about any of this. In, in France, there is a systemic ban on pro-Palestinian demonstrations. Uh, in Germany, a, a demonstration by pro-Palestinian Jews in Berlin has been cancelled by police. The German Home Secretary uh, on the news today, um, a, a listener writes, um, uh, was said, said in an interview that she was worried that images of the impending ground invasion of Gaza will make Jews in Germany unsafe because supporters of Hamas in the country will get emotionalized and mobilized. The hint being, don't show Israeli war crimes because these supporters of Hamas in Germany are, go are going to uh, uh, take action in, reaction in, in response to that. Saskia Esken, the leader of the one of the leaders of the uh, Social Democratic Party has cancelled a meeting with Bernie Sanders, the most popular Jewish pop, uh, uh, politician in the world, uh, because he had been too equivocal. Uh, it's not even like he was being wholeheartedly pro-Palestinian. Quite tepid, pro Quite but, tepid yeah, actually. Totally, completely tepid, as he always is. <laughs> uh, Frankfurt Book Fair has withdrawn a prize uh, from Palestinian author Adania uh, Shibley. In the UK, government buildings are lit up with the Israeli flag. The country looks like a Roger Waters live show right now. Uh, Suella Braverman, our Home Secretary, has said in a possible trolling remark that even flying a Palestinian flag may be a hate crime. Keir Starmer has banned Labour members from participating in pro-Palestinian demonstrations. Uh, the Guardian has sacked its longtime lead cartoonist, Steve Bell, for a supposedly anti-Semitic representation of Netanyahu. In the US, the State Department has uh, sent an email, this has been leaked, saying that 
government employees and not to use the phrases de-escalation, ceasefire, end to violence or bloodshed, or restoring calm. Those are direct citations. Uh, despite setting up a U.S. House Judiciary Select Subcommittee on the weaponization of the federal government, populist Republicans like Josh Hawley are calling on the FBI to investigate student protests in support of Palestine. MSNBC has suspended all of its Muslim news anchors. This is just a, a, a brief yep. survey of some of the retractions of uh, free speech uh, or even just normal speech. Um, right. on on this issue that we're seeing. So it, it, it seems that you, you were a kind of canary in the coal mine, really, as far as um, official reactions to, to right. this kind of speech is concerned. I, have I missed any big ones there? Uh, th well, there was a cancellation of a uh, 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 play in Germany about uh, by a Palestinian author as well. And I'm sure the list is going to be increasing by the time this, this show airs. And I think it's important to say in this context that amid all this concern about uh, how Israelis or G might, might feel uh, based on, you know, the discussion of Palestinian lives. Uh, the first victim of the violence in the United States of, uh, is a, a Palestinian boy, six-year-old boy, right? Um, so I think that speaks for itself. Uh, the, you know, the silencing uh, of, of Palestinian perspectives does have real fatal consequences in the United States as well as elsewhere. Uh, and yeah, and I think the other thing, you know, it's really, on the one hand, you know, I think when we're sort of, glued to the screen watching the the bombing of buildings that these bodies piling up in gaza it is i think natural to kind of say well um you know is this really that important i mean this free speech stuff like people are dying but to the contrary you know the only means we have of stopping this is at this point political protest donations will not reach gaza i mean if, you know they may over the next few years but not like at this particular moment we can't actually stop a genocide by you know giving money by with hopes and prayers actually political protest is all we have unfortunately so it is actually vital it is our tool in this in this struggle yeah i, I mean i have to say that w what we're seeing is the the ukrainification of of israel where uh, uh, a geopolitical situation that traditionally liberals have been at least on the fence about at least you expect uh, even a relatively conservative liberal to say, well, it's complicated. No, instead, uh, for the first time, I think, we're getting this compulsory uncomplication <laughs> of the issue. Celebrities, you know, posting memes for Israel, et cetera, et cetera, like they did uh, for Ukraine. Uh, the, 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 the kind of cancelling of ambiguity, the extinguishing of ambiguity, let right. alone <laughs> the possibility of the kind of pro-Palestinian feeling that we would um that, that we would expect to hope to see is is right. is really palpable um and i mean what was the other comparison the fact that um you were getting right from the start with the ukraine war um the message from governments in the west that this was just never going to be a matter of democratic debate and democratic scrutiny that that the governments did not want to hear your opinion on it at all and what is more, they weren't even pretending that their aim was to end it. Th this was the other kind of right. novelty about the Ukraine war, that governments weren't even paying lip service to wanting to end the war. It, they were totally open about its continuation being the desirable thing. I, I would just never get out of my head Hillary Clinton saying that this is going to be you know, Russia's Afghanistan. Well, I thought <laughs> Afghanistan was Russia's Afghanistan, but never mind that. That, that this was just going to kind of, you know, sap all of their energy and resources and so on and, and morale. It was it was made perfectly explicit that it was desirable that this thing would just go on forever. And we see that in that in that State Department email that you're not, you know, propaganda isn't even what it used to be. They don't even pretend that they're the goods. It's not even, you know, um, imperialism with a with a, a kind face anymore. They're not even doing the kind face. They're just no. doing the sort of the trauma milking, the memes, uh, the, the, the disinformation. The, I think the that needs to be, well. yeah, 
I mean, yep. as far as like these stories about, you know, beheading of babies, for example, there's a lot of uh, that the U.S. president endorsed, uh, various U U.K. politicians endorsed, and now the Israeli government will, won't confirm, even though, yeah. you know, this was circulated earlier in the media, um, that that's a very, that's a case where exactly we need free speech to be able to contest these, these claims. Yeah. I mean, I, I think another example of just really poor thinking on critical approaches is this comparison of Hamas with ISIS. That really, you know, which isn't to in any way to say what Hamas didn't do was in a horrific act of, of indiscriminate violence. But, you know, ISIS is another story and we need scholarly perspectives to, to criticize these uncritical conflations. Yeah. I have a scholarly question for you. And this is very specific. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, just growing up around sort of the, these issues and growing up in this sort of environment where constantly, you know, sort of this discussion has always been going on, you know, since I've been a child. Mm -hmm. And I remember the term Nakba, I did, mm -hmm. not hearing it until graduate school. Wow. And it also being a very controversial word to say and something that was officially something you didn't say and mm -hmm. then it was something that didn't happen. Right. And then over time, you know, uh, as uh, I read more Palestinian scholars, people like yourself, you know, where we were like, you know, okay, that is something that happened and that's important. And that changes your sort of founding myth of, the state of Israel. Right. Now we're having Israeli officials actually say, no, no, not only we did we do it, we're going to do it again. We're going to do it better. And yeah, I yeah. found that to so be it's very even better. shocking. It's this, this is going to be a second Nakba. And incidentally, we didn't do the first one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A second Nakba without a first Nakba. It's, a, it's an amazing thing. Yeah. So, uh, right. So you're, the question is what... Uh, when did it become uh, uh, like the not taboo to say that word at all in, in sort of like Israeli spheres? Mm-hmm. How is it? Be it's being yeah, involved. it's being like yes, like exactly. reorganized. It's, violence. It, it's almost as if, and you know, we actually have some empirical proof of this. Almost as if uh, Israel, you know, welcomes Hamas, the opportunity provided by mm -hmm. the violence um, in southern Israel to 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 sort of reveal its true colors. And yeah, I don't think that should be underestimated. I don't think the the kind of um, explicitness of of mm -hmm. the uh, the, the foreign minister that, you know, what what, what Israel polit Israeli politicians are saying right now, you know, definitely should not be um, ignored. It needs to be taken seriously. And I, I think it's, maybe it's a good moment to kind of um, flag some really important contributions that have been made in the past few days by by Jewish and Israeli scholars um, to this question of, of genocide in Gaza. Um, so uh, Raz Segal wrote a wrote an article for Jewish Currents. I just, everyone should look it up. If there's one thing I think people should read about what's happening right now, that is it. It's called, uh, I think, a, a text, what is happening in Gaza is a textbook case of genocide. And, you know, that says, so yeah, this is, this is in a sense, I mean, a, a, it should be a turning point for us, right? We, we don't need to even hesitate about, about using that, that terminology because they're, they're uh, offering it themselves. Yeah, I, I think that's um, that, that is crucial. Um, it, it is very interesting to see that actually the liberal press, mainstream liberal press in Israel, is just about the only readable thing on this topic, mm -hmm. and is is saying stuff that would get you kicked out of the UK Labour Party, kicked out of the University of Bristol, um, kicked out of uh, any government job in the in the US, uh, and certainly put on a. A, a, an employment blacklist if you were in, in any Ivy League school in the US right now. Um, mm -hmm. Hi, Hiret's uh, uh, newspaper is, is, um, is, I mean, going further than, than, than just saying that this is genocide, what's being done in Gaza, which it is. It's even going um, down the kind of, um, well, Peter Dale Scott kind of analysis of, uh, of Netanyahu having kind of cultivated Hamas potentially even had every you know reason in the world to let this happen to to uh, to ignore intelligence coming from the Egyptians and from Assad because of course that this gives him the opportunity to, um, to 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 do what he's always wanted to do in Gaza and also to override the sort of um, liberal hate he's been getting in Israel this year not because of what he does to Palestinians but because of well, because he's become the kind of the Israeli Trump in the eyes of Israeli liberals, this embarrassing guy who says the quiet part loud. So Netanyahu's got his own domestic um, crisis to to overcome. And, and uh, you know, you don't have to go to the kinds of uh, 
cranks and conspiracists that we like to speak to usually in order to get that analysis you you, you can get that from the mainstream press in israel right now um but yeah like i say th that level of um of, of of free speech and that level of joining the pretty obvious dots is something that you just can't do in any kind of mainstream right. media in um in, in the west right now and you can't even get out on the streets um, in many contexts, in order to um, to, to protest it collectively, um, you 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 you, sit, you make a, a case in the book for a materialist understanding mm -hmm. of anti-Semitism, and you make this very novel use of Abram Leon, a mm -hmm. Belgian Trotskyist, who who himself died in Auschwitz, um, and you give an account of his kind of posthumous reputation. Um, I mean, you represent this in the book as you kind of like doing the, the due, due diligence version of what you'd said more spontaneously and provocatively in uh, in that that uh, counterfire counterpunch piece back in uh, back in two thousand and eleven. But in, in some ways, it, it seems to me the same fundamental points that like it just seems absolutely amazing that so many of us on the left in the UK have spent the last decade hand wringing. Uh, in a state of kind of mutual recrimination, looking deep in our souls to check whether we are in fact anti-Semitic, checking our language, even though I never said anything bad about Jews, did I use a trope that could be heard or misconstrued? All of this agonizing about language and 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 and, and micro aggressions, usually when it's a room full of Gentiles talking to each other, there's not even any Jewish people in this conversation where you might have said the slightly wrong thing. And then all of a sudden, we're looking at, like, well, number one, <laughs> what actual anti-Semitism looks like. You know, Hamas butchering people at a music festival. They're not doing that because of tropes. They're not doing that because of microaggressions. This is this is microaggressions, okay? And then the the, the Israeli um, revenge project and and the Israeli genocide project, and you think, well. You know, if the tropes are so powerful, how come this is going on, <laughs> right? It's just the absolute idiot mindedness of of the kind of debate we've been having, which has all been coded by the logic of the IHRA definition, where everything is about this, these these microscopic um, uh, uh, transgressions at the level of phrasing and language, and then it all gets real all of a sudden in the Middle East and. Well, I just pray that we can um, take these things a little bit more lightly in the future, although I, I sincerely doubt it. But take us into the materialist definition of anti-Semitism to, to finish that you'd like to see us employing in future debates on this topic. Right. So I think it's not I don't uh, it, that this that the book I'd recommend to everyone, um, a materialist. Uh, it's not exactly a definition. It's an approach to, an to understanding racism yeah. mm -hmm. and anti and anti-Semitism. Uh, yeah. Leon Abram, uh, Abram Leon is someone who I think we need right now. We need his approach. The book is widely available. It's on Marxist.org. Uh, it was not finished. He wasn't able to finish it in his lifetime because he died in Auschwitz, but his friends finished it for it's for him. And it's actually been translated into Arabic and had an impact as well in Palestinians' understanding of anti-Semitism. And he, he grounds it in, in a economic critique of capitalism, and which I think is absolutely appropriate. I mean, of course, anti-Semitism precedes capitalism, but the way the forms it's taken are inseparable from the, the, the way that uh, the, the Western world has has divided cl uh, classes. Um, and I, I think, uh, yeah, so, so it's, it's something that focuses on on the way that uh, racism is useful to those in power and doesn't separate what's very what's important about a materialist uh, approach to anti-Semitism is it doesn't separate anti-Semitism from other kinds of racisms. It sees them as intertangled and, in, and entrenched with each other. And you can see it. I mean, if, if to give a really kind of embodied um, understanding of, of what that is actually like, just read his analysis writing in uh, occupied uh, Nazi occupied Bel Belgium in 1937. He's talking about colonialism. He's talking about Haiti. And he understands that what's happening to the Jews is, is related to the the, the history of, of colonial dominance throughout the Western world. And I think it, it, it one, another um, uh, I want to end maybe with, with a quote from, from something that was just published today uh, about genocide in Gaza uh, by an Israeli scholar. Uh, and it is uh, useful in terms of what we're, our conversation because it, 
it kind of explains what why it is that these the west western politicians of the world are so interested in um maintaining an apartheid state in israel palestine i don't i think we need to ultimately we need to bring this back to ourselves at our locations it's not just it's not about what israel's doing it's about you know, because they, they couldn't do it without U.S. arms, without U.S. funding. It's about why our governments are so interested in maintaining that apartheid and potentially genocidal system. So I thought this was an extreme. It's, uh, this is published today in the New Left Review. It's online. It's called uh, Impending Genocide by Cy Englert. And he says, uh, challenging that power, so the power of of the apartheid Israeli state, um, and it's about free speech as well. Challenging that power is impermissible because any attempt to hold Israel accountable for its crimes is by definition an attempt to hold our own states accountable for their involvement with them. Not only are our rulers prepared to let Israel level Gaza, they will even provide it with diplomatic cover and military supplies. So I think it's that, in a sense, uh, you know, to sound very dark and cynical, I, I, I am sorry to say that I think the U.S. is is using Israel in the same way we might say Israel is using Hamas to achieve its very dark um, end game. And I hope, and we have to stop that. Yeah, quite so. Um, well, Rebecca Ruth Gould, we can't thank you enough for for joining us on the on the popular show to talk about these fraught issues. Erasing Palestine is published by Verso Books and is available now. Um, and uh, yeah, well, we thank um, our listeners. Also, if you want a independent radical media, sometimes you have to get the wallet out. We'd love to have you over at patreon.com forward slash the popular pod, where uh, we're going to have some extras uh, for the, the paying punters as well. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.